So good morning. Uh, welcome to this budget session on this Saturday morning. Thank you all for being here. At this point in time, we call this meeting to order and we proceed by having the roll call. Mayor Daly Isla. Here. Council members Hiller. Here. Valdivia Acala. Here. Ortiz. Here. Emerson. Here. Padilla. Here. Nager. Here. Dobler. Here. Duncan. Here. And Lesser. We have 10 present. Serve to moderate questions, so take it away. Well, good morning. Thank you very much. Um, today, we're here to continue our discussion on the budget. Um, we've had good uh, small group meetings with each of you. Those were very productive and felt that they had laid a baseline for us. We had our open public presentation on the Tuesday meeting. Now, today, we really will look at a workshop environment, giving you the opportunity, uh, or I should say, giving our department directors the opportunity to present information about their particular department, go into a little more detail, allow you the opportunity to ask questions of them, which will then give us all a better understanding of the budget and the concerns or questions that you may have going forward. So with that, I will have to say a couple of administrative things. We are on a strict timeline. We do need to complete by 1 p.m. If we can complete earlier, that's great, but we do have to complete by 1 p.m. Many of us, uh, many of the department directors and other staff that will be on the call are part of the work share program and therefore must end their time right at 1 p.m. Anything that we don't happen to get to, which I'll be surprised, I think we're well organized and we should be able to complete by 1 p.m., but if we're short, we'll uh, transition and save those items for a later date. The um, real purpose today is to, uh, to get through the general fund projects. Um, and Jessica will have some comments here as well as uh, we lay things out. If you have questions, I'm gonna be monitoring my email. And if, uh, depending, if you think of something, you can email it to me and then I'll ask the question as well. We can answer questions today, but there may be questions that require us to do some research and get back to you. And if it's that way, then we'll let you know so that we can keep things moving along today and not run behind. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jessica for any other additional uh, comments that she'd like to give as we begin. Good morning. Thank you for joining us um, this Saturday. Um, so just to reiterate some of the points that Brent discussed, um, you know, today we're going to really focus on the property tax funded uh, fund. So that's going to be the general fund, special liability, and debt service fund. And just as a reminder, um, this is the seventh consecutive budget that we've um, provided without a property uh, rate increase. And so just the reason I bring that up is as we work through the different departments and the different decisions that have had to been made that are included in this budget, every year it gets increasingly more difficult and the the act the types of cuts the budget reductions um, that we have to suggest um, you know start to impact operations more and more um, so you know just wanted to reiterate that the department directors um, and their staff uh, went put a lot of work into this they you know evaluated their operations um, and really provided their best um, advice and counsel to the city manager. Um, and so one of the questions I've received over the last couple of days, and I think that this conversation will change slightly given the uptick that we've seen in COVID-19 cases. Um, but as everybody knows, last month sales tax performed better than we had anticipated. And so I've had questions um, just saying, if we were to see this trend continue on our you know, largest revenue source, would the cuts that have been included in the, ninth, the 21 budget have to be implemented? At the end of the day, the answer is yes. Um, the, we would have to see stable and significant or at least ongoing strong growth in sales tax collections year over year for it to feel the sh fill the structural gap um, that we have as a city. Right Over seven years, you have expenditures continue to go up, but then your revenue kind of stays um, basically flat with a little bit of growth. And so I just wanted to put that out there because that's a question I've received. It's a really good question. Um, but at the end of the day, 
even without the COVID-19 health emergency, we would likely be facing the similar decisions, similar discussion. So just putting that into context. So moving on to today, um, the list of, of funds that we're going to cover, we've broken out into the, the council's priorities. So the first ones we'll cover today um, will be fiscal sustainability. So that's going to be finance, HR, legal, executive, city council, and mayor. I anticipate those will go fairly quickly. Um, legal will discuss special liability, and then finance will also um, cover the debt service fund. After that, we'll move into infrastructure, which will be public works admin, TSG, engineering, forestry, transportation operations, the traffic operations division. We'll take a break. It's currently scheduled from 11 to 11.15. Um, and then after that, we'll talk about quality of life, the zoo, um, going into Department of Neighborhood Relations and planning, followed by municipal court, fire, and PD. So the way that we've asked the department directors to approach today is at the beginning of the budget process, we started with an approximate $5 million operating deficit in the general fund. So what that means is that we had $5 million more of expense than we did of revenue. So the, we are required to present a, a balanced budget. So the city manager reached out to directors and allocated a certain amount of cut for each department based on their overall budget. And so then each department had to go back and work with their division directors, their staff, overall <clears throat> team to identify what types of cuts would be able to um, limit the impact of operations, limit the impact on, um, on constituents as best as possible. But at the end of the day, you cut into the budget so much, you can only do so many programs. So after the departments evaluated that, they sent the city manager and finance back the list of cuts that um, they felt were um, consistent with the request. So I think what we've asked departments today is to have a quick discussion. Um, some departments will be really fast, um, but others will take much longer. So the questions we've asked them to think about um, is the 2021 budget, um, how or if operations would be impacted from 2020 to 21? What programs um, will continue that have been done well? Um, what new programs potentially? What programs will have to be discontinued based on funding or if they're just not working? Um, and then overall, if there's any fee or permit cost changes that have been integrated, we've been asked them just to touch on that. So I'd ask that you give the department directors or division directors, um, whoever speaking, a few minutes to cover that topic. Um, and then we'll open it up to questions. And so as the city manager mentioned, we are on a, a tight schedule, hoping to get through these um, property tax funded funds so that on Tuesday, we can focus on the internal service funds and some other, um, other funding sources. Um, with that said, if we can't answer it today, we have Alyssa on the line from budget and she will be writing down your questions and then we'll get back to you. So I think that covers all of my quick talking points. So I believe the first one up will be, um, Brent, were you gonna cover the city council and mayor? Yes, I'll cover the city council, the mayor, and the executive departments. Um, first, the executive department, which is the city manager's office, um, the two changes, the big changes that occur there is the elimination of the deputy city manager position and the elimination of the uh, emergency management position. Um, the elimination of those two positions was significant. Uh, big change for the department, uh, trying to work through work responsibilities with other individuals that will cover uh, those areas in a better way uh, and, and uh, working more with the directors and moving forward with different projects that the, um, we work with them on. So I feel like we'll, we'll make that change. It'll be uh, uh, a challenge, but I believe that uh, uh, we're making that adjustment now and there are other things that will be coming that will assist with that as we go forward with the uh, neighborhood relations transition. So um, emergency management coordinator position with that elimination, we've already had a meeting with the county emergency management and had a good discussion with them. And we're now much more engaged with them than we have been in the past as 
staff directly to them. We relied on Jim to be able to do that for us, so there wasn't a need, but now we're engaged with them and we're ready to move forward there. Um, minor little changes within the other similar little line items that you have with regards to travel being a little bit reduced and, and some other areas. Um, any questions related to the executive department? Questions for city manager? Councilwoman Ortiz. You're muted, ma'am. Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I have one on the emergency management position. Are we doing away with that and we're relying on the county or how would that be handled? Yes, ma'am. We are position and we will rely on the county. The real reality is, is we've been relying on the county uh, in some ways all along. It was just Jim that was coordinating with them. And so, uh, you know, a lot of information flowed from them to Jim. And so, uh, you know, it just wasn't a direct contact for me because Jim was doing that. Now, just for example, last night received an email from the county emergency management about the possibility of storms that might come in last night and then forwarded that out to a couple of department directors just in case that were to happen, they'd be ready. And so that's how we're re relying on them in a greater way now. What other duties did he do? Um, there were duties related to uh, teaching uh, CPR and other types of emergency management, uh, you know, information command system, incident management system uh, programs and uh, that training, CPR, he also did all of our badging for all of our employees. Um, he worked with us anytime there was an incident, just as with the COVID uh, related to FEMA uh, work that was done there. So there were a number of other duties and responsibilities and we've shifted those around. There are also some, uh, some went to fire, some went to police. And uh, so that's what we've done in order to backfill the loss of his position. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Other questions for city manager? Okay, city manager. Uh, I'll move on. Um, in the mayor's, uh, in the mayor de uh, department, um, the, really the only change was there was a change related to the um, benefit selection, which caused a bit of an increase. And then there was also uh, the decision that we would no longer contract with Granicus to provide a software that helps us for managing boards and commissions. Trey Hygus will be taking his own spreadsheets and using those to track and, uh, what boards and commissions need appointments to them. And so it'll be an endeavor. Um, Trey is already working to put that together. We feel that uh, there's a good chance that he can do so. He's very talented. And so we're hopeful that he'll be able to do that. And that's a significant savings as in, I think it was eight or $9,000 cost for something like that. And so if he's able to do so, it'll be very significant. Uh, if it is a problem down the road, we'll revisit and look at other software companies that may be able to provide the same thing. Uh, it was just time with the cost that we saw there to make the transition away from that. And then I'll just go ahead and cover as far as the council budget, there really is very little that changes relates to your department um, uh, for council. Any questions? Questions for city manager. Yes, Councilman, uh, Councilwoman Nayer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, not a question, but just thank you to Trey for taking on that endeavor and saving us that money. So good luck to him. Thank you, Madam thank Mayor. You. I don't know if you have questions. I don't know if you can. Okay, I'm going to thank you, Mayor. I'm going to sound like a complete dork, but that's okay. Um, I'm looking at two things City of Topeka 2021 preliminary budget. Then I'm looking at the line item stuff that we were given. So, what page are we on? Well, I guess I didn't look at the book specifically. 37. But what page 37 or 39 or 40 somewhere in thank, there thank you spencer that's it thank you mayor okay city manager i had a question oh councilwoman heller yes sorry out here in the, in the i don't world. see you pardon me okay um 
in the line item budget for city council, there's actually a there's a there's a reduction of over forty thousand dollars in employee benefits. Um, I wasn't quite sure how how that happened. Health insurance. The new council um, had different benefit um, choices. Some members aren't utilizing it. Oh, some people aren't using their health insurance. Is that is that it? Yeah, that could be the case. Otherwise, they chose you know single versus a family. It's just the the different. Um, benefit makeup for the new council members or existing council members may have also changed their yeah, benefit choices. I see. So this could bounce up and down significantly then from year to year with the same <laughs> number of council members. That's correct. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for city manager before we proceed? Seeing none, city manager, next department, I think. Uh, is that you, Jessica, with finance? I think it is. <laughs> All right, so going on to finance, and that should be page 51 for those following along. Um, in terms of the general fund for finance, the biggest change is that we eliminated the senior grant program administrator position. And as everyone, um, every council member and the mayor as well, um, you know, in our, in our small group meetings questioned, um, you know, we as the department and then as a team citywide, we'll have to figure out um, alternative resources. So that may be um, engaging an outside consultant for a specific um, type of application if we didn't have those resources in house. Um, other departments will have to take on additional responsibilities surrounding their own um, finding grants, maintaining grants, and so on. Um, it is one of those that we'll have to, to see how it goes because obviously the, um, that position has yielded um, some very good and uh, strong grant opportunities for us. Um, we will have to revisit the, the grant policy and procedures, um, but we felt in terms of the options for the finance department to um, contribute and meet the target for reduction, this was one of those positions that would have the least impact on overall operations for finance. Um, and then we also and we also reduce some travel and training. Yes, Councilwoman Valivia Alcala has a question. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Just going back, I, I know I drilled into this, Jessica, when we had our initial meeting, um, and you said that this person was a really valuable resource. She had he or she, I think it was a she had a breadth of you know of knowledge, a depth of knowledge with writing these big grants. So um can you, how much was that reduction with that person? Am I saying it here? Um, the, the position was vacant, so we wouldn't have had the choice to keep that particular person on regardless. Um, and so that's also, again, one of those choices that we made to try to keep filled positions as much as possible. Um, I, I'd have to get back to you in terms of her specific, that position's specific salary and benefits. But, but you do feel good that we're still going to be able to either with contracting out that hopefully won't cost an arm and a leg or with the talent that we already have on staff to be able to go after those big grants as needed, especially during this COVID time, right? Um, well, with COVID and, and the FEMA work, we're, we're currently allocating resources to find somebody who can um, focus on that, you know, given um, our elimination of the emergency manager position. Um, Ideally, if she was still here, she would have taken on those responsibilities, but she's not. And we needed to be able to continue with contracts and procurement, payroll, accounting. Um, so our, our other priorities in the department, um, we're gonna do our best to make it as seamless as possible. And with the goal of being able to achieve those large grants, we'll continue. Um, we will likely need to have an update next year or mid year saying, this is how it's going. This is what we're, you know, finding these are the, the struggles that we're identifying <clears throat> if an outside consultant can't work on a specific grant um well but it I, is something we're aware of i i would just hope that before a year if you feel like things are going south and that you really need more than what you know you're being provided in that way that that you would let us know absolutely thank you okay. sure thank you mayor 
Thank you. This is Spencer. Oh, I have question. two questions. Yes. Mr. Duncan. Two things, I guess. One, I would like to see before we pass this budget, and the other, I would like to see before the end of the year, I guess. The first is, and it doesn't have to be down to the dollar, but could we get some sort of general cost assessment of how much dollars we thought that position brought into the city in the work that they did so that we can take a look at what the real, quote unquote, real value of that position would be um, to help us for future look at whether we think we can bring that position back whole or not. The second thing, which I don't expect before the budget would be passed, would be, and we talked about this in our group meetings, is it would be nice to see some analysis and get some numbers back to have at least somebody, whether that's one person or a group of people, on contract so that when things do come up, if we feel something's big enough, we could reach out to them and what those expenses would be. So that if we feel like going into next year, that's something we can add back in at a lower cost, we, we know what the real cost of that would be. Thank you. And I, I would add that we have um, grant resources throughout the city. So um, um, police, fire, you know, obviously neighborhood relations has a very strong grant program. Um, you know, the niche in finance was that, sh that this position was going to coordinate all of those and then for particular grants like Impact Avenues was able to coordinate the effort behind it. So with some of the changes that the city manager is implementing, um, we're hopeful that we can have spread out the, the um, responsibilities to several people. But all these questions are right on, you know, and I think we're not the only department that will face that, you know, these cuts do cut into operations. So I think, you know, finance, we're working through what it looks like. And, you know, this is one position for us, but I know that other departments have had to make other decisions that impact even further. So I appreciate the, the questions and we will do our best to get that information back to you. Um, but yeah, this, you know, these are the, the struggles and challenges that we're facing in finance. Okay, any other questions for Ms. Lamandola? If, if I could ask one, um, yes, Councilwoman. Um, you mentioned the issue of hiring somebody to manage FEMA money, and I, I thought I had heard that come up the other day, and I asked one of the key staff at Neighborhood Relations, and she said, no, that was not happening. Could you talk a little more? I wasn't sure, based on the way we were looking at using FEMA money, that we would need any administrative assistance. Is that a, a plan or not? Well, I'm not, I'm not aware of the, the discussion you had with DNR. Um, however, anytime you get federal money, FEMA money, COVID money, there's going to be some level of administration that has to happen because you need to document, prove, maintain records. Like FEMA, I believe it's three years. Um, so there's, there's always going to be a level of administration. Um, we are currently in the process of um, developing a committee and then also the the process to monitor and request funding from the the county regarding the covid money so i'm unfortunately i'm not sure what the conversation was and what the particular topic was um but this is something that we're working through currently it, it could be that what i was well i know what i was thinking about was the cares grants that we've been considering um and it in those cases, it looked like we were sending money to partners and that it would be fairly simple to manage, very similar to what we do with our CDBG money. Um, well, the CARES money is unique. The, the vast majority of the money that's coming in through DNR, um, you know, it has a lot of requirements on it and how it's spent and who can spend it. Uh -huh. So in some cases, the money coming in, the city is unable to use it. And so we're working with partners throughout the city to make sure that that money stays in the city of Topeka and we don't end up having to like give it back to the, the federal government because we couldn't use it. So I'm not sure maybe that's the discussion you had. I don't know, city manager, if you had other. I just didn't know that we were, I, I thought I'd heard that we were going to hire a staff person. And then I was inquiring about that and the answer was no. Now, you mentioned county COVID money, which we were not talking about. So I think we might asking. be talking about separate pools of money. And I was, <clears throat> excuse me, not aware of hiring a specific person um, for that purpose. Um, okay. Many places, I mean, I've, I've done consulting work on it as well. Many places will hire an outside consulting firm to help with that process. And depending on how much we get, maybe that's something we look into. I wasn't um, suggesting. DNR money, 
is under the CARES Act and it's for specific purposes. It's most, I believe most of it in Corey or Katrina can answer this better, um, would be allocated based primarily on the CDBG formula. Right. The money coming in from potentially from the county is that that um, the large dollar amount that was allocated to states and local governments. We just don't we're not big enough, um, so we don't access the CARES money um, directly. We we will access it through the county, who has been allocated money from the state. Let me chime in here real quick here. Um, as it relates to the money that's coming to neighborhood relations from the CDBG CARES. Those are being handled by staff. They'll be administered by Katrina. They'll make sure that it gets spent. Most of those services are being provided by third party vendors through existing contracts, or we have reached out to people that we know could spend them. And that's what you were, was brought to you last Tuesday. And so okay. that's gonna handle that amount of money. And then as, as Jessica mentioned, putting together a committee from various departments that have needs related to COVID and where we can spend money improving our buildings, uh, taking care of uh, some needs related to PPE and other types of functions that we can get reimbursed for. And so we're gonna be studying the information that comes, more and more guidance continues to come. Lisa sent me a recent sheet that uh, frequently asked questions that helps us to better understand what types of things we can go after related to CARES grant. So we as a group with the committee, uh, with finance and other staff members will put together a good application to get what we can from the county related to that. It still doesn't allow us to go after revenue replacement, but there are other types of things that we believe we can get reimbursed for or uh, receive in a future date. So that's how we're handling it for now. If at any point we feel like there's a need that we can't handle it internally, then we will seek additional help. And I think that's the, the way we wanna leave it at this point. Uh, we already have shortage of funds for finishing in this year. If we feel like, though, we're going to miss the boat with relation to being able to make an application, we will make a change. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, City Manager, or Jessica, I'm not sure who, this is just a pretty basic question. The information that you gave us yesterday, or at the last meeting, on that $3.1 million of uh, CARES money and we have the third party vendors that we're going to be having, you know, do these things. I, I don't know if I looked for it at the time, but it just came to me now and we pay them to do that for us as well. Correct? Okay. Fee? We provide, we provide the money to them that they then hand out to their, their staff. And so they go through a process and then we administer the grant for, uh, based on the expenditures they have, they get reimbursed. Okay, reimbursed, but I mean, 500,000 that is going to community action and we want that to go in this specific way, this specific way, this specific way, but do we pay them for executing that? You may have told me that yes, but I didn't understand what you said. Yeah, I think there's a, I'd have to ask uh, Corey to be sure, but there may be a portion of that that's administrative that they receive. Okay. Uh, for administering yeah. that for us. We I would, I would like to know that. Yeah, we'll verify, but I'm pretty sure there is. I mean, we're able to claim a piece for administration. I believe they are as well, okay. but we'll confirm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, um, All right. real quick while we're, we're on finance, um, just to bring up the debt service fund. So the debt service fund is primarily funded um, through property tax, but it also receives funding from the motor the motor vehicle um, ad valorem tax. There's some funding related to star bonds that comes in and then it gets paid out, um, special assessments, and then there's some miscellaneous um, interest income and other types of revenue, but most of that is attached specifically to the expense that it needs to pay. Um, the, the debt service pro forma, so the, the funding that's included in the 21 preliminary budget is consistent with the approved CIP plan. Um, and so that CIP plan includes the full Quincy Viaduct project as well. Um, so that's just a pretty quick high level review of debt service fund. I'm happy to answer other questions. Questions? I, I did have one. It, Councilwoman on Hiller. It's on page 189, um, that sheet is. Um, 
there is nine, um, a $9.6 million expense item that's under other. Mm -hmm. I wanted to check about what that was. The, it, it appears that with the balance going down by that much, you know, we're, we're not doing well. So I, I hoped you could explain that. Sure. So that amount is just the, <clears throat> the state forms uh, require us to allocate or um, appropriate your reserves. Um, otherwise, it's used, it, it accounts for the reserves. Otherwise, it uses it as revenue. So that is just the estimate um, that we had four weeks ago of revenue minus expense and what was left over. Um, it's We don't intend to use it. It's just a budgeting technique that the city of Topeka has employed that you show um, your reserve balance for a variety of funds. I, and we've received that question regarding other funds and it's it, it's the fund the, the available fund balance um, to appropriate. It gives us the authority to spend if we had to, but there's not an intent to spend. Thank you, because I had a question about that same thing that the change in general fund non-departmental. Is it that the state requires us to put it there or I guess I was thinking about how in the summer we generally do a budget amendment if we need to have extra revenue or we've had unbudgeted, uh, major unbudgeted expenses that, does this mean that we would not have to do budget amendments if we've budgeted this already as an expense? My understanding is that budget amendments are only required um, with an expense going over the allocated approved budget. So in terms of revenue, I don't believe you would be doing a budget amendment. Lisa, if you, if I'm wrong, please jump in. Um, in terms of the general fund, it's the same process. We um, would show the amount that of reserves um, based on that calculation. Now this is going to be cash basis, um, whereas rule typically depending on the fund. Uh, so that may account for the difference. But again, we're not we're not anticipating using twenty one million dollars in the general fund. That is our reserve balance. Um, it's just part of the the budget process in the city of Topeka. In terms of whether it's required by the state of Kansas, we were looking into this um, four or five weeks ago. I don't have a specific answer for you, but it is how the city of Topeka has historically budgeted um, that that line. Uh, if I could just make a comment, I have had concerns about this before. I don't know that I've seen it happen in these big funds, but in the small funds, the staff was budgeting um, the pretty much the entire fund balance, even though we did not have a program or a plan for how to use it. And the council had expressed some concern about making sure that if there was a thought about using it, that it did come back to the council. Um, and. I'll just express concern about that. I want to make sure that it, you know we're not just sort of opening the door for the the money to be spent without it coming back to the council in in any of the funds where we've done that. I don't know if there's a way to put some language in the budget authority. Um, that's it for now. Thank you. All right. Jessica? Um, that, that's it from the debt service fund and bless you and uh, finance department. So if there's any other questions, we're available. Um, but I think if there's no other, I don't see any quick movements. Um, so we will move on to human resources. Jackie here, oh there she is. Hi Jackie. Good morning, everyone. Sorry about that. It took me a second to find or to turn the camera on. So the um, human resources operating budget, um, the significant change that you'll notice is the change um, that reduces the funding allocated to the Topeka Way to Work Youth Employment Program. And this program is being reduced uh, to $15,000. It was 30000 in the previous last several years and our plan of how we will maintain that program giving the reduction in funding is that we plan to partner with the USD 501 TCAL 
and um, try to convert the TWTW program to a school year youth employment program where we can host hopefully up to five students um, to be interning in various departments throughout the school year. And that would be um, those students that are involved with TCALC. Um, and so it's, it's something that 501 approached us with um, last year. Um, and then with COVID and everything, we just hadn't gotten that off of the ground yet. So we'll plan to try to commence those conversations and, and roll that out. Other operating um, departmentally, um, we have um, reallocated where personnel related expenses um, are um, charged to for those employees um, that work with the risk programs, a portion of their salary will be charged to um, either work comp or, or risk. And the same with the health fund to try to um, achieve the reductions that we needed to, uh, but adequately provide all of the services that we need to for our department. We've reduced our training budget um, as well as our um, education and travel. Uh, so that's um, the significant changes to the HR departmental budget. Um, this morning, I also wanted to talk about the other funds that Human Resources is responsible for managing, and those are the risk funds, property, um, insurance, workers' compensation, and health. So if no one has any questions about the operations portion, then I'll, I'll move into those risk funds. Comments or questions for, yes, Councilwoman Ortiz. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Jackie, I'd like to know more about the, you knew I was going to say something on the way to work. Um, I am tickled to death that it's not cut completely out, um, but I'd like to know the new process that we're going to go into. Um, so I know we had talked about partnerships, so I guess um, I didn't know who, so I'm assuming 501 is the partnership. Um, but um, I, I really... Uh, always liked it as a summer program to give them some funding for the kids, you know, to do funding. But I'm, I'm tickled to death that we have something as opposed to nothing. So um, if you can get me the logistics of that so I can um, kind of guide the kids on how to apply or what to do, I would appreciate it. But again, um, to my fellow colleagues, I'm just glad that we didn't cut all the money out because we've got to do something for our young people. Thank you. And Council Member um, Ortiz, I would tell you that um, when we are able to have more specific conversations with 501, we'll definitely share all of the, uh, what the program will look like and, and the criteria and how students can get involved so that you all are aware of that as well. Jackie, we also have Councilwoman Nager with questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Jackie, with that program and partnering with 501 and TCALC, um, since we have reduced our funding that's going towards this program, are we partnering with them to use some of their funding, employ some of that, or are we just working with less funding and so there will be less resources for those students? At this point, um, I'm operating under the uh, assumption that it will be less programming funding total and that we'll try to work with the two resources, City of Topeka as well as the USD 501 to try to make it a, um, a developmental experience for those students. So we will reach fewer students, definitely. And um, a portion of the funding that we had each year was dedicated to professional development during the summer. So they would do professional development one day a week. And so my thought is by partnering with 501, that will fill the professional development portion and that will allow us to pay the students for their work experience within the departments at the city of Topeka. Thank you. It would be great to get an update on that as you develop that with the school district. Absolutely. Amy. Wonderful. Anybody else have questions for Jackie? Jackie, you may continue. 
Thank you. I'm going to move into um, uh, information on the property insurance fund now. Um, and that, uh, if you're following along in your book, the property insurance line items are on page 198. Um, and you all may recall that you received a notification from Mr. Trout a few months ago about the significant change and increase in the 2020 property insurance premium. And just um, to kind of remind that groundwork, um, the property insurance market changed significantly and it had a great impact on our insurance premium for this year that we had to make a lot of adjustments for. Um, the driving factors that were explained to us um, were that because of significant losses uh, from wind and hail events in our region over the past several years, insurance, insurance um, went up significantly. Excuse me for just a second. The city's insurance premium for 2020 increased by 340%. Um, and our current insurer um, provided us with a notice of non-renewal. We marketed our insurance to more than 40 insurers and many declined to quote. None would quote all of our property and many would only provide a quote for a portion of our property. So that resulted in our premium um, increasing to $1.4 million for 2020. Um, and it provides us with $250 million worth of property value insured at a $250,000 or 2% deductible, whichever is greater for wind and hail and a $100,000 deductible for all other perils. Um, we um, also had to secure flood insurance for fire stations number five and number eight, which are now considered to be in a flood zone to ensure that we have adequate coverage should we have a flood event. And that premium for 2020 is about $23,000. So given the hit that we've taken this year, we are not anticipating a significant change in our premium or our coverage for property in 2021. Um, I would tell you that we were very disappointed in how we were um, unprepared for the significant change. We work with a uh, risk broker, consultant, Gallagher Risk Management Services, and um, we didn't start having any discussions about a change or a heads up until October and our renewal is a January 1 renewal. Our budget is adopted in August, so we were we were really caught behind on, on being able to prepare financially for a, a hit like this. We have um, went out for RFP process for a broker um, consultant on the uh, property. And um, later this month into the first week of August, we do have presentations with four respondents and we will be evaluating um, making a change that's um, in the, the best interest of the city to help prevent something like this from happening again. Um, but I just felt it was important to kind of remind you of how we got to where we were and what we're trying to do per, to be proactive um, where the property is in, is concerned moving forward. So with that, if there's any questions on property, I'd be happy to answer those. Questions for Jackie? Councilman Padilla, I mean, Councilman Lesser, the other mic. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, couple questions. Uh, the RFP that went out is, is that for the, the preliminary one that, that I had seen um, was for a consultant to then approach the different carriers um, such as Gallagher, Lockton, Willis, whomever. Is that the way this is, is still designed or are you doing RFPs for uh, actual uh, handling of the, the insurance and placement of the products? 
So we did do two separate RFPs and our first RFP um, earlier this year, maybe um, late February, early March was for a consultant with the idea that the consultant would then assist with identifying brokers. And we got um, three responses to that. And based on the COVID hitting and the overall financial constraints that the city's been facing, um, in consultation with um, the city manager, we determined that it was not probably the best time or prudent to take on additional expenses of having another layer of consultation. Um, and because our, our bids came back where it was anywhere from on the low side, 75,000 to another $150,000 of annual expense that would be added to the property given the higher premium that we already had. So we did not act on that RFP. Um, what we did then was went back and and good, good, good move because that's that's stupid. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's stupid, stupid money for what what you're asking for. Yeah. So we 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 tested the waters just to see if it made sense to make a change and. So our RFP um, was for a broker slash consultant and what we'll be focusing on when we go through these presentations is making sure that there's not a lot of commissions or, or um, added fees that um, are hidden and that there's full transparency and that they are really um, advocating to make sure that they are brokering our business um, appropriately. The city of Topeka has not had a property insurance claim in the whole 13 years that I've worked for the city. So to see an increase like this was, I can't even tell you, it, I was more than astonished to, to be facing something like this because we well, have I will tell you because I did have some, some conversations with with uh, city manager Trout did reach reach out to me to ask me about this, and I will tell you this 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 is was abs and I'm, I'm not referring to you but this is was absolutely mishandled by by the provider. Um, uh, I even looked at, you know, it sounds really good, you know, that they said they approached 40 different carriers or actually 70 carriers. Well, that, that all sounds good, you know, but I get, did take a look at the list and by looking at the list, I could tell you of, of these 99. Everybody. It's not what they do, you know what I mean? So um, it's like sending, it's like having State Farm on the list to write the insurance for the city. That's, that's, that's not what they do. And that's what so many of these people on this market summary list, they don't, they don't even write those coverages. I mean, or are there not options? And then what, what was even more scary to me is, is, the ones that are missing on there that that weren't approached that are players in our region, you know, uh, for that. So, um, I'm, you know, that's 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 history. But um, wow, um, we are seeing some increases. We are not seeing those type of increases um, in uh, in the industry, especially not last year um, of that percentage. We're just not. Um, the other piece is, um, we paid him a significant amount of money to sit down with us and say, Hey, here's what's coming. You know, here's what you're looking at. You know, what type of risk do you guys want to take on? Just like you said, Jack, we haven't had a property claim in 13 years. So, you know, those conversations should have been had with us by, from them before they dropped this bomb on us of, of, you know, uh, what the, the actual premium is. Next question I have is, uh, you answered my question on how we're going out there. I'd like to have a copy of the RFP so I can so I can look at that. Um, are we? Are you doing it without having the benefit of seeing that? Are you doing it from the perspective of we're going to select who it is and then have them go to market, um, basically assigning them everything or? Are you designing it to say, here's, here is our, uh, 
uh, here's our portfolio and come back with actual pricing. How are we addressing that? So the challenge is getting a formal uh, quote from insurers. They really won't do that much sooner than 90 days out. So what we tried to do is start this RFP process early uh, because our uh, renewal will be a January 1 renewal so that we could be working with the broker consultant and having them become very familiar with our portfolio before they would then take it out for market um, in the fourth quarter for a January 1 renewal. So that didn't really answer my question. We're going to select who we're going to go with and then give them all the markets to approach versus saying come back to all of them come back to us with with pricing i guess is what i'm, I'm asking we we won't tell we will tell them that we need them to market property vehicle inland marine and work comp excess insurance but we will rely on their expertise on the markets in which to approach for those lines of coverage i don't think you're understanding my question okay um so are we going to go and say, I'm just going to use e easy names. We're going to go and say we have, we Briar Payne Insurance, People's Insurance, and Janisac Insurance has, 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 a, has res let's say, responded to this RFP. Is the way that this RFP is written that all three are going to come back with their competitive prices for us? Or are we just making selection of, we're going with Briar Payne over Janisac and People's Insurance, and they get to go to every market that's out there to, to try to facilitate um, the insurance. Yeah, they'll get, we will make a one selection for a broker consultant. It will not be contingent on um, pricing for lines of insurance because that is not renewing till January 1st. Um, and, and so in our presentations that we'll have, those are the questions that we'll be asking. How would you market? This is the, you know, we will share with them where it was marketed previously and where we think there were deficiencies. And, you know, is it, you know, one question is, can, can you get us an early quote earlier than 90 days out so that we can better plan through a budgeting process? And, and so we'll be interviewing each of the four respondents to try to understand understand how they go about that and how they can help us be more proactive so that we don't end up in our but they will not there, the the determination on the broker consultant is not going to be tied to um, specifically marketing our lines of coverage because of how our renewal works so we're trying to have them in place so that they can um, represent the city through that renewal process, um, but they would not, we are not gonna select them based on the renewal. Does that make sense? Is that responsive to your question? Not really. Um, who, who uh, uh, Who's gonna be on the selection committee of this? The selection committee is myself, um, Shannon Langston, our risk uh, program manager, Jay Euler, our procurement director, and then uh, potentially Mr. Trout um, as available. Okay. Um, I would be happy to serve on that um, to assist or um, I think it's important that uh, we do go out to, uh, because of the significant increase in where we're at, we do go out and, and try to find someone, th those, that, that money's stupid, whether it's me or we try to get somebody like a, a Denny Payne, a Brian Janisak, someone who's experienced out in industry to do that. Because of what's transpired last year and the way that happened, and you know, I'm just gonna be the first to be honest with you, none of us are experts at anything, and I don't know. I'm not an HR expert or anything like that, but um, I am an insurance expert. And the way that we're proceeding on this, um, uh, 
is is probably needs to have an, an expert on that because um, the answers to the questions that I'm, I'm not getting the answer to the questions and, 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 and I don't mean that in a bad way. Like I said, this is what I do for a living. I don't do HR benefits and stuff for a living. I don't I dig sewers like Tony does or build things like, like Neil does. But, um, the way we're approaching this, all it's doing is putting us back into a position where we're going to hope who we select is better than who we had before. And we aren't really changing anything or asking the right questions uh, to eliminate something that we just had a 341% increase in, in cost. Um, and so, and I, I would speed that up. You're exactly right. 90 days is, um, carriers don't like to give pricing out prior to 90 days before, just because things can change. Losses can change in that period of time. Rates can, you know, fluctuate. But for a big risk like this, um, we should already have somebody selected of who's going to be taking it over for for next year because this is we're 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 a we're a big project, um, very complex projects, and we also want to be able to have different risk. We want to be able to have the conversations and that then even kind of have to come back to the council in something like this. And this is how I handle it with our larger risks that we have is what's your risk tolerance? We haven't had a claim in 13 years. So it's not, you know, um, those are things that really need to come back. Um, but anyway, that, that's, that's my two cents. So I'll, I'll let you guys decide how you want to do, how you want to proceed with that. But I would highly recommend you get someone with some extra p expertise. The amount of money you came back to have a consultant to do that is stupid. Nobody's going to do that. I mean, you could hire probably Denny Payne or, or Brian Janicek to sit on that committee for, for five grand or, or, or less, you know, um, and those guys are both talented people that could do it. Um, but you need some, you need some direction on this. This is a huge cost. City manager. Yes, thank you. We will, uh, yeah, we'll consult and figure out how we can move forward with that. I think that's good advice. Um, having someone that is uh, familiar with that will be uh, will be helpful. So we'll take we'll take that advice and we'll figure out how to uh, incorporate that into the process. Miss Russell, there's no more questions about property. I uh, would like to move question. into the workers' compensation fund, and that's found question on page here. 199 of the book. Did anyone hear us? Oh, were we muted? Oh, pardon me, uh, Councilwoman Hiller. Sorry, thank Don't you. Um, related to this discussion, um, why is it that we are doubling the amount for insurance from 20 to 21? I, I don't think that we're doubling it. Well, it goes from 1.4 1, 1. million to 2.9 million. Because the increase in the uh, property premium that I just talked about was not budgeted in 20 because the uh, increase came after our budget. So we've had to adjust internally to accommodate the 2020 premium, but we are budgeting that flat for 2021. I see. So the you mentioned the 1.4, and this says projected 2020. So I thought that that's how much we were spending for the calendar year. No, not the so. The premium increase was not projected in the 2020 budget. So we are actually spending this 2.9 million this year. Yes, that's the number on the sheet. For our predicted budget, yeah, I um, I know okay. that's the yes. what's there for 2021. I guess the the budget workbook says projected rather than budgeted, and so I was perhaps misinterpreted the number then. Um, related to that, is there a reason why we've never made any claims in the 13 years? We, we primarily self-fund and hold a very high deductible. So our, our um, tr prior to 2020, our, our model was a $100,000 deductible. And so um, smaller um, 
losses that would be under that threshold, we have self-funded for to keep the premiums um, at a um, moderate level. Um, so um, the damage and the, the storms that we have encountered have uh, resulted in less than that $100,000 deductible threshold uh, up in, in, in the time that I've been here with the city. So we have had some hail events where there has, and some wind events where there has been some structures or vehicles damaged, but they've not reached the threshold of our deductible. Thank you. Okay, Jackie. All right. So with that, I'm gonna to transition to the workers' compensation, um, which is on page 199 in the book. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to just show you a visual slide on claims. So bear with me for just a moment. Jackie, uh, Ms. Russell, I think that you need to uh, ask Taylor to make you the host so that you can share the screen. Well, it says that all participants are able to share. So, huh. um, if it still has an issue, I'm not sure if it's still going to work. No, it says that everyone should be able to share. Now I've, uh, I can't see anyone. <laughs> All right, let's see here. If it doesn't work, I'll just go through it verbally um, and I can send these to you. And that may be best in the interest of time here. Um, why don't I just, it's not a significant and I, it's just two slides that I will um, send to you guys. I'm sorry. I, practiced with this yesterday and it looked like it was going to work just fine but on workers compensation just for a little bit of connection is unstable. Grant, do you want to move on and then we can come back to HR? Yeah, I think so. Oh, oh no, there she is. Are you frozen? I, I'm getting a message on my screen that I have a low internet connection. I think it's, I think it's a city network problem, actually, because we got the same thing over here. Um, okay. It looks like it's back up on our We got it. Okay, I'm, I'm sitting in my office. to be so. here in person, right? Quickly, the cost containment measures that we um, utilize on the work comp include mandatory generic prescriptions and bill review. For 2019, our generic utilization was 100% and our bill review resulted in 58% savings. Our five-year average for bill review was 52.4% savings. Our budget for 2021 for workers' compensation is flat compared to 2020. Are there any questions relating to workers' compensation? Any questions for Ms. Russell? Councilwoman Ortiz. Hi, can you ask her to repeat the how many cases we have in the year when she first started out, please? There were 92 new claims for 2019. And that compares it to 128 for 2018. And I'll send you these slides e by email just as soon as I get done. 
Thank you. Okay. But they were really big claims. We, we did have a few significant claims um, in 2019. We had uh, most notably the tiger attack, which resulted in significant injury. Any other questions for Ms. Russell? Okay, Ms. Russell. All right, I'm going to move on to the health fund, and that is found on page 200 of the budget book. And with the health fund um, and the premium holidays, I also thought it was good to give a little bit of background um, and, and just set a landscape of this fund. So as of May 31st, the health fund had an unencumbered cash balance of $4,288,763. And through May of 2020, our healthcare expenses are running 23.7% below expected. Now I do caution that because of the COVID, a lot of um, appointments and procedures were canceled, particularly in April and May. So I won't be surprised if we see a increase in our expenses for the remainder of the year that will get us close to our expected, but it is running low through May. Um, and because of the on cash on hand, um, we felt comfortable given the city's um, revenue challenges um, and the loss of revenue that the city's encountered. Um, we did reach an agreement with all of our unions for premium holidays, which will relieve um, the city and employees by not having health care contributions deducted. So there are two premium holidays where the city will not make contributions into the health fund. And that's going to result in approximately 855,000 of city funds that don't have to be diverted. There are three premium holidays for employees and that's going to result um, in the employees not having to make contributions of about 290,000 into the health fund. And those holidays do not remove any funds from the health fund it's only that they will not be added to the fund in the pay periods where those premium holidays occur. We feel, as I said, um, comfortable with unencumbered cash, as well as our stop loss protections that we have in place for the health plan, that this does not jeopardize our ability to cover any um, of the liabilities that could come uh, in, from the health plan. So historically, uh, the health plan cost for 2019 was 10 million 191. I'm sorry, 10,191 dollars per employee per year, um, and that overall plan cost per employee per year is lower um, compared to the benchmark of the Willers, Tellers, Watson uh, businesses. The average per employee per year um, health insurance cost is about $13,087. So we're running about $3,000 less per employee per year. Um, and um, our health care expense trend over the past 36 months has been 5.6% which is a very low increase um, over that three year period. It, it averages about 10 to 12% medical inflation per year. Over the past 24 months, our expense trend is 1.2%. However, what I keep on my barometer is over the last 18 months, our expense trend is 14.7%. So in, in self-funding, um, you have your highs and your lows. And if we look at just our most recent 18 months, it's spiked up a bit. Um, that seems to be the normal evolution, but it's also something that we keep our eye on. But as I said, we're still right now through May running about 23% below expected expenses for our fund. We are anticipating a slight increase to healthcare expenses um, from 2020 to 2021. And this budget includes a 4% increase um, to that. Um, I would tell you that um, 
we all remember where we were in 2011 with the health fund going broke and the significant impact that that's had on our employees. And um, what we've been able to do is, I believe, strike a good balance. And we have been able gradually over the past several years to start making enhancements to our plan design to better meet the, the needs of our employees and their families. And through the healthcare advisory committee and um, recommendations that they bring forward, as well as the negotiations that we do with the unions um, on the health care cost share agreement. Um, we are um, we, we believe that we are um, having plan design that is largely meeting the needs of the masses. Um, some of our recent enhancements that we've been able to do is um, we've uh, steadily been increasing the amount that the city pays for dependent tiers of coverage. So towards the family um, coverage. Um, and for 2020, the city is paying 68% and employees pay 32% of the premium equivalent for the base plan tiers. For 2021, this will increase to the city paying 70% and employees paying 30% for those base plan family tiers. In addition to the increased city contributions, um, we have the voluntary wellness and wellness program that provides for an incentive for those employees who choose to participate. That incentive is a 13% premium discount. Um, and in 2021, we are enhancing that incentive um, to include spouses on a voluntary basis and those um, spouses on our health plan who go through a health risk assessment and, and follow up vi visits with our clinic based on their health risk, the, um, there will be an additional 1% premium savings. So that will be up to an option for 14% savings off of your health premiums. Outside of the wellness incentive and the increased contributions, um, we've also been able to reduce deductibles incrementally over the past several years. Right now for 2020, our base plan deductible for individual is $2,000 and $4,000 for family. In 2021, the deductible re will reduce to $1,800 for individual and $3,600 for family. Um, the other changes that we've been able to implement are um, around wellness and well-being um, include providing uh, continuous glucose monitors at no expense, nebulizer and CPAP machines at no cost. Um, and in 2020, we implemented um, where employees can, through their Blue Cross Blue Shield health plan, have six mental health visits without a copay. Um, so we are trying to make sure that we're containing expenses and modifying our plan to meet the needs of our employees. Um, we also went through an RFP process for the on-site clinic as that had been in place for five years. Um, and uh, we did select health staff to continue um, with that on-site um, clinic provision. Um, the contract that we are negotiating um, is uh, reduced fees over what we've had in the most recent contracts. Um, and so we um, are looking forward to that new contract starting in October and the, uh, the lesser administrative fees uh, for the city with that new agreement. Those are the highlights that I wanted to share regarding the health plan and I'd be glad to stand for any questions. I do have a couple. Councilwoman Nager to be followed by Councilman Lesser. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Jackie, I just want to thank you again, you and your team, um, and thank the unions for their flexibility with working with the health holidays, um, because that's providing some, a much needed pool of money for us to use in other areas of government. And so I really appreciate that. I also really appreciate that we're prioritizing this preventive care with the continuous glucose monitors and CPAPs, making sure that our employees are getting that constant preventive care and keeping them at a healthy level, not only for their own well being, but also making sure that we don't incur those larger expenses with those, um, the associated health risks and um, major issues that come when 
people aren't being treated regularly. So just thank you for prioritizing those things for us. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilman Lesser. Yeah, Jackie, can you tell me what um, you'd said that on the family were we 70%, 30%, what is it on single? On the single, um, I believe, let me get that in front of me. I've got it right here. Um, I think. I think non-wellness, um, my computer. Well, okay. Non-wellness, I think, is 66% paid by the city. Would be okay if I email that to you since my yeah, that, that's fine. It's rough. It's roughly the same. I think what I was wanting to make sure and confirm because I didn't have it in front of me either is we're not paying the full single, correct? We are not. Um, okay. When we 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 were able to move away from that, um, and we get to we get very close about ninety three percent for those employees that participate in the wellness incentive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Ms. Russell? I had a couple. Yes, Councilwoman Heller. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jackie, for the report. This is, it, it's really good to have those bullets on, on how it's improving. I do have some budget related questions. You talked about the health holidays. Um, I think the number you used was 883,000. Um, is that accommodated? I know that we've worked that out just recently. In the budget for 2020, the ending balance is set to be 5,993. Is would we take that 883 off that then if we're reducing um revenue into the fund? I don't think that we would take it off of there um, because through May or on, we, so when I say that the unencumbered cash on hand through May is 4,288,000, what that means is that we have encumbered all of the expenses that we anticipate for 2020 already. So we have encumbrances through the end of May of $6,190,000. And so the, um, we may have higher than expected expenses and that's really what that unencumbered cap I think we lost Jackie again. Yeah, we're having a network issue here. Oh, she's back. She's back. Sorry. Um, I, I would expect the unencumbered cash to continue to grow, but there will be, um, it will grow, that 855000 will reduce from what grows, but it does not take away from the balance of the fund, but it will reduce the revenues that go into this fund for the remainder of the year. Okay, then do we have a number from you? It, what I was looking at was only a $6 million balance, and if we were going to have roughly a million less than that, um, and it carrying across, the, the projected ending balance was $4,740,000 for 2021 a um, million dollars less than the fund balance for 2020. And so just looking at the budget numbers, it looked like we could be in five years not have any money in the, in the fund. So I would need to defer to Jessica and her team on how they've factored or whether they factored that into this preliminary budget because I don't work with the budget side of it. Okay, I just that just looking at the budget, the um, other question I had was 
regarding between 2019 and 2020, the contractual services went from what had been 10.7 million and then 11.2 million, and it jumped 4.6 million to 15.8, um, and which then sustains into 2021. And, and I wondered what the big jump was in cost. I don't think that there's been a big jump in cost. I think that we um, had a uh, more accurate line item. Um, we, we made some sub accounts that allowed us to attribute um, some expenses that might have previously been under medical um, expenses um, to clinic um, and, and just uh, more specific line items. So our health risk assessments, our flu shots, and those things that are being administered to the clinic, we moved into administrative fees, but that does not equate for four million dollars. I'd, I'd need to work with Jessica on how that journaling may have impacted that line item. Um, the clinic I think that you can follow up on. I'm, I'm sorry. I think we can follow up on that. Okay, yeah, the yeah, clinic expenses. Thank yeah. you, because what we're seeing is just a collapsed line anyway. There's just three lines and expenses, personnel, contractual, and commodities. And the other two are low and stay up. Well, I take that back. The personnel jumps phenomenally. And that, I think, was because we were moving a couple of people over. Um, yes. But yeah, if, if we could check. I, I'm just, from what we see in the budget, was concerned about the viability. I, I know we've talked about it, but the budget um, was looking more fragile. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll follow up. Thank you. Other questions for? Ms. Russell? Okay. Ms. Russell? That is all that I had to discuss today. Okay. All right, Ms. Le Ms. Lamandola? Okay, so we'll go ahead and we have one more department um, in this section and it, that's legal. So if, um, if Lisa is on, if you wanna quickly discuss just the you know, high level, um, any changes in the city attorney's budget? Yes, thank you. Um, can you all hear me okay? I hope so. Mm -hmm. I don't have a webcam, so I'm sorry you're just looking at uh, a blank screen, but I um, apologize for that. My two division allocation summaries are on page 71 and 73 of your book. Um, the first is the general fund um, divisions, general government, criminal prosecution, and then the second is the civil litigation uh, fund. Um, what I did is similar to what Jackie did in her apartment, in her department, we reallocated the costs uh, between general fund and special <coughs> liability fund for some of our personnel um, who work, you know, significantly more in special liability and we hadn't taken a really um, good look at that so we made some adjustments there of course we basically gutted our um, training line items and that type of thing so very very similar to what Jackie did I wanted to touch up on one thing that had been brought up as a question with regard to the um, contractual services line item and the special liability fund um, there was a question about why um, the 2020 2021 figures were so much higher than 2018, 2019. And I think if you look um, under that line item at the top of page 73, it does look like there's a difference, but it's because 2021 and 2020 are actually projected um, numbers and 2018, 2019 are actual. Um, so I went back and pulled up the 2017, 18 and 19 projections and they are really similar, right in line with what's projected um, for 20 and 21. Um, it was 728.957 in 2017, basically the same figure in 18. And then 19, it went up about 743.786. So it's pretty consistent um, as far as projections go. Um, as you know, with that particular fund, we have to kind of um, take into consideration you know, how many cases we think will be coming down the pike, what types of um, payouts might 
correspond with those cases, and it's kind of a little crystal ball um, situation. And in 2022, we may need to take a look at um, a really good look at that. But I think for this upcoming year, um, the projection's pretty good. So um, unless there's any specific questions, I know we're already, what, 15 minutes over our end time. So let me know if you have questions, and I can answer them. Yes. I know Councilman Duncan has a question. I have some questions. Uh, first of all, just because I don't never is the special how where is the special how is the special liability fund funded? Is that general fund? Is that money from other sources? The special liability fund is a property tax funded fund as well. So if you look on page uh, one seventy seven of mm -hmm. the budget book. Um, the tax line would be your typical property tax that both the debt service and um, general fund share, and then the miscellaneous. Okay. Um, what is the other line? It had nothing for 18, 19, and 20, and 21. It's The amazing. other line is the same um, allocation method as in the debt service fund and the general fund. It is the available reserves that are appropriated. It's part of the, the state form. It's part of the city of Topeka's practice over time. There's not an intent to use it, um, but the the way that the budget has been developed over the last several years, in, is my understanding, um, is that that just reflects the reserves. We don't intend to use it. It's it's part of the budget presentation and then the state form. Gotcha. Do other departments ha have legal? In other words, is the police attorney part of their budget and separate of this legal staff breakdown that we see? Do utilities have other legal, can, can you give me a quick overview of who has lawyers and who doesn't, I guess, or legal counsel and how that works? Um, there's a police legal advisor that is funded by police, but he reports to me for licensing purposes, but he's housed at the LEC um, and works directly with all of those folks over there. He comes to uh, all of my staff meetings. He goes to all the TPD staff meetings. Um, he's kind of a an in-between, but for licensing purposes, he does report to me um, and does so consistently throughout the week and makes me aware of any situations that are upcoming and in need of my input. Yeah. Okay, but no other, but every everybody else within the city is goes through you, right? Whether it's utilities yes. or other department, even though if they have other funds, they still go through your department. Correct. Okay. Uh, anybody else who needs legal services comes to the legal department. Uh, TPD is the only one who has their own designated legal advisor. Gotcha. All right. Page seventy. If we look at uh, the code compliance cases, um, in twenty nineteen there were five hundred and fourteen cases filed. Three hundred and forty nine had compliance. Eleven had convictions. Do we know what happens to the other 189 cases? I mean, I'm sorry, Councilmember Duncan. I, it's you're kind of muffled, so I can't hear you real well. Okay, you on page that? 70, we had 514 cases filed, and then it gives us a breakdown Correct. of how many we came to compliance with and how many were convicted, but it doesn't tell us what happens to the other almost 200 cases. I can get that detail for you if you like. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have it, but and I don't have Paran here. And I know I some could be dismissed, that, but I'm so. just curious if we're just what's happening to those cases and, and if they're just getting left behind or if they carry over to the next year or what if we do any carryover. In other words, maybe some of those yeah, are reflected I'm, in this year's numbers, but I would, yeah, that'd be curious about that. You know, and it, it, you're probably actually right on that, and I can, but again, let me get Corinne's input, but lots of times when you're trying to gain compliance with folks, um, it, it may not, I know this, this sounds crazy, but it may not actually happen within a year, depending on when the filing occurred, um, and lots of times if there are um, elderly folks involved in a case, or if there are folks um, who are lower income but are actually showing um, some sign that they want to try to get the work done, um, they just check in and make, and as long as they are making these efforts and they're showing the progress and they can show the municipal judge that that's happened, um, 
those cases will just keep kind of flowing through the process. At any point in time when that type of progress is not shown, then that's when a different course of action is, is taken. And then lastly, on page 73, under the, and this is on some other page, but con is contractual services all primarily outside legal counsel? Um, is that part of it, um, but it also covers expenses such as, you know, there's been an uptick in mediations and arbitrations. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anytime that you um, engage in those types of um, processes, you have to have a mediator come in and pay him or her. You have to have an arbitrator come in and pay him or her. Um, during litigation, there's oftentimes uh, depositions. When you have depositions, you have to pay um, the court reporters who come in. Um, we also, if we have expert witnesses that um, are part of the process, we pay them through this particular line item. Um, so it, it just, it's that, but it's a lot of other things as well. Okay, because from 18, 19 to 20 to 21, uh, although 21, I mean, that's a very, could we get a breakdown um, of, of legal? I'm sorry, council member. I can do that. I, I, I need to mention too, that that includes the payout of claims and settlements and uh, judgments as well. So if you have a particular year where, you know, you had a, a judgment come in that was pretty high and we had to pay it out that's going to be reflected in a particular year. So if you look at the actual for 18 and the actual for 19, I mean, it's a big difference. And that kind of differential is going to be associated with, you know, a payout of a judgment, most likely. But okay. I can get the details. Well, that actually raises then another question. So then I guess two things then. Could we get a breakdown of what was actually paid to legal counsel versus everything else? And second of all, why are we line iteming a settlement under a contractual service. I mean, it's that's clearly not a contractual service. That's clearly a legal settlement. So I would just at some point wonder why we don't itemize that separately or why we include that in contractual services if that's a if that's a well, settlement issue. Council, councilman, one that depending on how the settlement is paid out, it could actually it it is technically at times a contractual service if it goes to a third party before going to the person or people. Um, and then there's also a limited number of categories um, that we could reflect it in. Um, in terms of the 2020 and 2021 contractual line, I think Lisa's point is really important. We, but we try to budget the same, the actual budget amount year over year, because in the event we are involved in civil litigation or other types of litigation, we don't want to necessarily budget the amount that we would expect to pay out. I mean, that is showing your showing your expectation, and that could hurt our overall um, approach to the case. Yeah, I understand that. I guess my point is, I just would like to see at some point what our actual outside direct legal counsel that we're yeah, using is, so we get a cost of that. Um, we can work on putting that together. Okay, thanks. That was. Thank Any you. other questions? Uh, yes, I mean, related to that, um, we did get single sheets on legal and prosecution general fund as well as special liability, but they don't really display what was just discussed. There is a, there is a line item for, for claims and damages in special liability, but it, it doesn't show up across. So perhaps yet yeah, one way to help reconcile that would be to look at those funds. I had one specific question. I know that the discussion of moving people from the legal de the two people um, moving their pay base from the general fund You're to breaking up. I can't hear you. <laughs> um, is this better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. There was discussion with us that the salaries for two of the attorneys was to be moved from the um, general fund in civil litigation to the special liability fund. I know that that just happened recently. The budget that we have in front of us on page 73 still has four full-time attorneys um, and sustains, actually increases the cost for personnel in civil litigation. 
Um, so I wanted to check what that means. Not the, the whole position doesn't necessarily move into the special liability fund. So, for instance, Bonnie, um, our senior paralegal, she was 100% funded from general fund, um, but this year she's going to be funded 25% from special liability, 75% from general fund because she has implemented a case management system that deals almost exclusively with um, litigation cases, and she is going to be the individual that kind of implements that whole process and monitors it. Um, Lindy Brewer, who is actually part of the civil litigation division, um, had 50% of her um, salary funded through general, the other 50 through special liability. So we increased that percentage because she actually does more work in uh, the civil litigation division. So, I mean, those are some examples I'm of just what not we've done. There's no reduction in what we see in the budget for general fund. Um, I think there is, and there's there's only an, well there's an increase in, in about 120,000 over on the special liability side, so it looks like we got the two people or depending on who they were, over there. Just something to check, perhaps. Okay, we can do that. There should be a hundred twenty thousand dollar or thereabouts variation, but Jessica can, can speak to the, you know, what's actually reflected in the book. I don't. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't cross check it against the personnel roster. It just sure. wasn't reconciling for me. Thank you. There is, in the special liability fund, there is an increase of about 124,000. Yes. And if you look at the, the city attorney's office um, across the board, there is a decline in personnel services as well. Um, and so the balance um, we can look more into. But in terms of the FTE, um, just because you're funded 20% out of a different fund, we may not in the budget book reflect that, you know, 0.2 um, in that other fund. Um, but we can look into it and give you some more detail. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's an increase in 120,000 in the civil litigation division and an increase of 120,000 in special liability. So. We will look into it. Um, if there's any other questions, otherwise we'll move on into um, public works. I think Lisa did a good job covering special liability. All right, I think public works is joining us with a, a picture yeah. <laughs> of the, the intercom. <laughs> well, there you go. There's Jason, there's Dr. Pete. <laughs> Uh, good morning, governing body. I've got uh, the public works uh, management team uh, here in the conference room, and uh, we're going to go over the uh, general fund portion of the budget today. Everybody hearing me okay? Good. Um, so if you start on page uh, 130 budget book, uh, you'll see a description of the entire public works department. Uh, that includes basically our nine uh, divisions, and those uh, divisions are spread out over six different funds. Uh, but like I said, today we're just going to focus on the uh, general fund uh, divisions. Uh, before I kind of get into the division budgets, I just want to kind of highlight uh, some things I think are important from the department standpoint. You know, this is the um, wrapping up uh, the fourth year I've been here in Public Works, and so this is the fifth budget uh, we've actually prepared. And I'm just really pleased where the direction of the Public Works Department has gone over those four years. Uh, we focused a lot on our management systems uh, to improve city service, and that kind of uh, focuses on two areas, asset management and performance management. And you've heard us talk a lot about asset management with respect to pavement and increasing the PCI condition, and we're working on that across our other uh, infrastructure categories. And then the performance management piece is measuring uh, what we do from an operational standpoint. And I just want to highlight uh, some of those key services that folks out in the community see. Uh, when I got here in 2016, we talked a lot about potholes. We still continue to talk about potholes. 
as I was told this body, they were talking about potholes in 1874 in the city. It's just part of being in a city. But I'm happy to report in, in 2016, it took us an average of 28 days to close a pothole work order. Uh, where we're sitting today in 2019, we've seen a 53% reduction in that time to close. Uh, so that average days to close a pothole work order is about 13 days. Those high severity potholes we respond to immediately, but if something's not uh, something that needs immediate attention, it can take a little bit longer. And so that reflects you know, some of the management practices that Jackie Vogel and her team has put in place, as well as Brian and his team implementing the pavement management program and working on our roads. Some other operational issues and ones that we continue to work on, alleys. We've talked to a number of council members about improving our operational process on this. But where we are today versus 2016, 2016 it took us 41 days to close an alley uh, work order. Uh, today we're at 22. We want to get better at that, uh, but you know that's a 46% reduction in the time to close from where we were in 2016. Uh, forestry, I, I know a number of you have questions about that and we'll, and we'll get into that, but same, same story there. In 2016, 34 days was the average time to close a forestry work order that a citizen may submit. Where we are today is about an average of 10 days to close those same work orders. And the one thing I want to highlight across that productivity is all those services we're still doing with the same number of people that we had in 2016. So, you know, we've heard from you, the governing body, about being efficient, being productive, and I think those three kind of uh, points highlight uh, how we have through management systems, investment in equipment, investment in employees, good team members uh, meeting those goals. You know, uh, within the department, we, we talk a lot about, you know, our, our primary focus is making sure we're doing the, the right treatment time at the right location. And, you know, our budget's set up to do that. And we also talk about having capacity to respond to those unforeseen challenges. And I think that's where, you know, this budget may put us most at risk, but we're going to uh, manage as best we can uh, with the reductions we put in place. Overall, in the general fund, you'll see uh, we're about $7.1 million. That's a 12% reduction uh, from 2020 on the general fund portion of the budget. And with that, um, I'll, I'll talk about how we, we kind of got there. You know, we, we looked at, across all the divisions, how can we uh, basically reduce and minimize the service impacts uh, to the community. And so, you know, like my team usually does, they responded to that challenge. We've been looking at opportunities for alternative, alternative service delivery, whether that's contracting out for some additional work, whether that's employing technology to uh, basically reduce some of the position functions. We've looked at restructuring within the organization to better align uh, with our needs. And so I think that 12% reduction in the budget, you know, will not have a directly observable impact to most of the citizens. You're still going to see potholes get filled. You're going to still see us respond to those uh, work orders uh, requests. I think where the, the budget impact for us this year has the greatest impact is, is on our team. You know, there's just a lot of uncertainty at this time. We know times are tight, and so that impacts morale and, and just productivity of the folks here. And so we've got a good team, and uh, we're going to continue to do the best job we can for the city. So with that, I'll, I'll dive right into our, our division budget and hit some of those highlights. Uh, the first one we're going to go to is TSG and admin. Uh, this is on page 137 of the budget. Uh, basically, this division represents administration, which includes uh, my position, uh, the office assistant, our community education, and then our technical support group. And a lot of people don't know what the technical support group is. Uh, but these folks um, are really core to our organization. They evolved early on from basically uh, our geographic information systems, basically maintaining the data about the location of our assets, a lot of the mapping that you see out there. And they also uh, maintain our CityWorks work order management system. So this is the technology that many of the departments in the city use for their daily work. When you submit a C 
see quick fix request as a citizen, whether that's for public works, whether that's for legal, whether that's uh, for utilities, planning, those types of things. Uh, TSG maintains that software application and they're like a mini uh, applications consultant embedded in the organization. They'll go and work with the department and say, hey, we have this work process. How do we adapt the software to basically track that data so we can manage performance and provide customers? And then along the lines of the uh, GIS system, uh, GIS has grown significantly from just a mapping product to an information management system. Uh, whether it's the project portals that you see online or open data portals, this is managed through our Esri software product. Uh, this past year, we were able to uh, get away from Socrata, which was the software system that we'd use for open budget, open portal, and use Esri, which was an existing contract uh, that we already have in place. And so this team uh, within TSG uh, basically manages those applications, works with departments to deliver those services. We do have a reduction of a position within this department this year, and that was our user system consultant. And this was one of those kind of tough decisions where we looked at how do we maintain services with the least amount of impact. And this position uh, primarily is responsible for data updates uh, as we change, install new in infrastructure, uh, replace it out. They update that uh, electronic information in the system. So we're going to have to spread that work over two existing positions. So you know, we, we expect maybe a little bit longer delay in processing of information, but not a decline in, in the overall service. And then we've also you know, basically uh, looked at including some contractual services money uh, within TSG and admin to support that if we do start to build up a backlog of maybe using uh, an outside vendor uh, to help us catch up. And, you know, that helps us manage workload without having uh, the long-term e employee expense associated with that. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and see if you have any questions on uh, administration or technical support group. Questions for Dr. Peake? Uh, I have one. Yes, Councilwoman. I'm looking at the line item budget and I'm trying to track First, I just love the reports about the efficiencies and, and what you've done. That's, that's really great. Um, and you mentioned dropping Socrata, um, and I actually don't know, didn't know the details, but I've been concerned that we had duplication and an overabundance of software systems. So overall, that sounds good. As I look at the line item budget, what I'm seeing is, is between 2020 and 2021, there was a line item for other purchase services, which was 48,570 down to zero. And then on service licensing, a drop from 289,000 to 224. Um, which are, are those both Socrata? I mean, is it, are we getting that kind of savings on just one software change? Uh, no, council member, the uh, 48,000, that basically reflects transferring uh, the expense of the pocket park maintenance to uh, the parking fund. Uh, two of the things we did within administration is uh, this fund has paid for the landscape maintenance on uh, Kansas Avenue uh, of all the improvements that we put in there, as well as the contractual payment to DTI for maintenance of the pocket parks. Um, and so in looking at ways that we kind of keep those services going uh, while taking pressure off the general fund, uh, we move that out to uh, the parking fund, uh, given that the majority of those things are adjacent to our parking infrastructure. Uh, with respect to the software, I, I, I'll get you the, the detail on the... Uh, For services, but but not to that magnitude. So, so additional questions for Dr. P. If clarification on the parking fund, which we have been dealing with for the last year or two, um, as being close to insolvent already. So this is this is there's no money that goes with this, and and instead the parking fund is being asked to pick up this task. 
Uh, Councilwoman, so we'll, we'll talk about the parking fund uh, next week, and I just okay. I'd, I'd kind of rephrase: it's not an insolvent fund. Our concern with the parking fund is the cost of maintaining garages versus the reserve balance uh, could consume that fund. Uh, we feel that you know, with the the operating revenue there plus the changes, we've uh, got a number of positions that we've eliminated in the parking fund. Uh, that we're able to maintain that. Uh, we've also talked about the parking fund uh, with the revenues that it currently collected pre-COVID could maintain operations, but the, the main concern was the capital expense uh, related to the garages and whether we had sufficient funding uh, for garage repair and replacement long-term. But like I said, we'll talk in, about parking in detail next week. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Dr. Peek? Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jason, this is just a quick question. I don't, when you talk about third partying out, do you have a specific vendor that you already go to, or do you go through a temporary agency? And I mean, how does that usually work? Uh, great question, Councilwoman. So it works in a number of different ways. Uh, we do have an on-call vendor uh, that supports city works and every type products. Um, but we do also do smaller separate contracts if we need a temp worker uh, with some data entry capability to assist with that. So we may go through a contracting agency. Or if it's a, a different application or service needed, we may go through an RFQ to hire that specific vendor. Okay, thank you, Jason. Yes, ma'am. Other questions? Okay, I guess we can proceed. All right. Uh, next, we'll talk about the uh, engineering division. Uh, and I just, you know, a couple things I want to highlight here before we go into the detail. So, uh, those of you that were on the governing body in 2016, uh, there were a lot of concerns about project delivery and the time that it took to get projects out, the number of projects that carried over on an annual basis and didn't get complete. And you know, I'm happy to report that you know uh, Brian Faust and his team has really turned that process around. I think our communication of expectations on projects has improved. Uh, projects that are going to be two seasons, we let citizens know. Projects that are typically going to be completed in one construction season are done. And you know, we've been able to move the needle on our pavement uh, management program. Uh, we're currently in the process of analyzing the updated PCI data, and we'll be reporting that out to the council early fall. Uh, initial indications is we're well on track to meet that goal of a 60 uh, for PCI and set us up for success possibly to exceed that goal over the remaining years of the sales tax program. The other thing I'd highlight about the engineering division is you know, this budget still maintains an average project load of about 15 to 16 projects per project manager, assuming that we have all those positions filled. We are experiencing some turnover uh, within the department due to our early retirement, as well as other opportunities for some of those key professionals. So uh, that's definitely an area of concern uh, for us about the ability to hire and retain good people. Uh, there, but I feel like the, the division uh, is managing projects appropriately. Uh, within the division itself, uh, we had some restructuring uh, and elimination of positions. The total you see in the budget book basically represents a, a net reduction of one, uh, but there are several positions involved in, in restructuring that. Uh, we've moved the uh, management analyst out of administration into the engineering division. Uh, and we've created a new position of a business service manager through elimination of the assistant city engineer. And the purpose behind this was, uh, you know, if you look at our operating budget, it's, it's uh, in total is about 22 million across divisions. And the balance of that is made up in our capital project spending that puts us over that 40 million mark. And I felt that, you know, one of our, our weak areas has been the financial control an assessment of our project management team. And that's through no fault of anybody, but just the way that we were structured and the expectations on those positions. So we've uh, 
uh, reallocated positions basically to provide better oversight and management of all the capital funding expenditures uh, within uh, the engineering division. But that team will also provide a supportive role to all the other divisions in public works, so to help performance management targets as well as looking at our asset management programs. Uh, we did basically the positions that were eliminated within engineering were vacant positions. Uh, this was an EIT, an engineering tech one uh, that we used for construction inspection. Uh, both of those uh, positions, we have the ability to contract those out through capital project funding. Uh, so as long as there are limited engagements, um, there is a difference in cost, but you know it could be minimal. If we had to contract those out at, at full time, uh, it definitely would be a, a greater expense to that. And with that, I'd stand open for any questions on the engineering division. Questions for Dr. Peak on engineering. Councilwoman Nager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, um, Dr. Peak, if we do get to the point where those contractors are getting to be more expensive and we're using them more readily, that will be something that we revisit and go ahead and incorporate into another budget. Is that what you're proposing? Uh, yes, Councilwoman, that would be something we'd want to analyze as we're using those uh, expenditures for smaller projects. How does that compare to the positions we eliminated? And we felt that was not in line with what we needed, we would have a discussion. Uh, then the question just becomes, you know, we're, we're paying that out of a capital project versus the operating budget that you're approving today or discussing today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Other questions for Dr. Peak? All right, Dr. Peak, you may proceed. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to uh, the next division. Traffic operations, page 153 in the budget. Uh, so uh, this group is uh, our operational folks. They're responsible for uh, maintenance of our um, traffic signals. Uh, they do the reapplication of our uh, painting, or what we call our long lines. That's the yellow center lines or white edge lines. Our crosswalks, they maintain the signals associated with uh, intersections and school zone crossings. Um, and they also assist during the winter time as needed with snow operations. So I mean, they, they, they uh, perform a lot of different work. This budget, though, also includes uh, our expense for street light. And this was one of the areas that uh, we did look at uh, reducing or basically maintaining a flat street light budget uh, this year. Um, and it, this could be, you know, have some sort of impact on the community in the sense that what we've told the city manager is from an engineering analysis standpoint, we have sufficient street lighting uh, within the community. So if we look at our traffic standards about areas that need to be lighted, uh, we have sufficient traffic or street lighting. Uh, this represents a little over 8,000 lights maintained by Evergy and about another 1,800 maintained by the city of Topeka. Uh, so with this budget proposal, we are holding uh, street lights flat and would not take on any additional uh, street light request. The other um, reduction that we had to do within this is um, basically the, we eliminated one traffic operation position that was a long-term um, leave position. Uh, that Once that long-term uh, medical leave ended, we uh, eliminated that position and we shifted uh, cost of some of the equipment operator positions over to the motor fuel fund, uh, which impacted two positions over there. And I'd stand for any questions on traffic operations. Questions on traffic operation. I see none. Okay. All right, the, the next uh, budget uh, piece we want to talk about is forestry. This is on page 147. Um, as I started the conversation with you, I talked about the uh, increase in, in productivity in forestry. I just want to kind of highlight that this position, or this uh, division, has a total of nine positions that are responsible for over 60,000 trees uh, within city rights of way and uh, property that we maintain. Uh, 
just like our pavement management, we're working on an asset management program for our trees. And one of the things we're lacking is kind of that condition assessment of our trees. You know, what's the overall age and health of all the trees within our city? There are a number of studies that talk about the benefits of trees towards you. Uh, livability and quality of life, and we consider our urban forestry a key asset in our community. Uh, our entire team of uh, foresters, uh, the majority of them are certified arborists, are on their way to becoming certified arborists. Uh, a lot of the services they do are routine as far as uh, trimming and pruning, but they are also kind of an emergency response team when we have high wind or storm events that require cleanup to get our roads open so our emergency responders uh, can get out and get through. Additionally, we've, uh, over the past four years, uh, incorporated the use of our forestry staff during snow removal. They're not driving the large uh, dump trucks with the plows, but we are putting them in the small pickups with the plows or delivering and loading <laughs> material. And that's helped us improve our, our overall response time uh, on snow removal events. Uh, we've, this is the one division budget that um, did have a little bit of increase in it in the overall, but like I said, we're 12% down. Uh, that continues uh, us managing on our, our uh, service level that we're at, and I'd stand for any questions that you may have on forestry. Questions on forestry? Seeing none, you may proceed. All right. That, actually that covers all the general fund portion of uh, public works. So I don't know if there are any other questions we need to answer related to public works. Anybody in the body have any questions for Dr. Peake? Yes. Yes, Councilman Duncan. And I, I guess I'll, I'll ask this later of the overall, but of the what is it 14 positions in total, is that correct, that have been eliminated from public works? <coughs> right. I just want to clarify that number. Th that is correct, okay. Councilman Duncan. We, we had a reduction of 14 positions across all funds. Six of those positions were in the general fund. Okay, and then my, my real, the reason I want to clarify was how many of those were, are currently or have been filled? And in other words, people are being dismissed from those jobs at some point, and how many of those are empty positions at this time? The uh, total number of filled positions uh, was five of the 14 were filled. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Dr. Peake? If none, Jason, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Other, uh, next, uh, Ms. Lamandola. Oh, the time is 11.04. Um, I think that it's time for a 15 minute break. Uh, so everybody, we will recess again at 11.20 and we will be here soon. <laughs>